basically again as i said we uh, today what is happening is people are becoming more individualistic as human beings and uh, they want to say in things that they are doing in life whatever they do in life they want to have a say including uh, the brands that they buy so uh, companies are realizing as i had told you earlier that it is not going to be about commanding and controlling consumers anymore it is going to be collaborating with them welcome you all out uh, of uh, vision board uh, so in this episode generally we bring cmos and marketing leaders from corporate and uh, we are live from last one and a half months and we are very overwhelmed by the response from our marketer community uh, today we have a very special guest uh, who are who spent 20 years uh, of his uh, early career uh, in corporate side and now from almost last 10 years that he is into education space uh, so i'd like to welcome mr anand narasimha uh, from jagdish sekh school of management welcome mr anand thank you thank you arindam okay so mr anand uh, you know uh, my first question would be that uh, you know as you have spent uh, early of his uh, career in the corporate side uh, 20 years i believe 20 25 years that you spent the corporate side and uh, now you are into academic space so uh, so how what the change that you see you know in both the side you know of the i uh, basically the reason for my moving to academia was very simple that i had worked for about 25 years in corporate and uh, what happens in the corporate sector is after you reach a certain level uh, it starts becoming more of the same you know so i think i had my share of uh, the corporate sector and uh, i got whatever i needed to do so i decided that i need to change track and uh, do something a little more meaningful than just earning revenue for some companies so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that uh, yeah. that actually drove me to think and i said what should i do and i thought it will be interesting to move to academics because it gives me an opportunity to share my learning and experience with young people uh, the other thing i felt is that there are not enough people from the corporate moving over to academics especially in the management space and i think it's very important because uh, management is a practice oriented profession a practice oriented uh, degree and uh, it is people with a lot of corporate experience and that can bring real world flavor into the learning so i thought i need to do my bit and that is what drove me to academics Okay. Uh, so yeah. i thought it will be a natural transition yes and uh, that's the main reason actually yeah interesting um, so mr anand that uh, you spent a decade you know in marketing space that uh, you must have seen the era that when you know that um, the tv print uh, you know that um, uh, used to lead the you know that the marketing mix and now last maybe you know 5 6 years especially during the pandemic uh, digital or the online taking the you know the center uh, stage it's an interesting question and often asked uh, you know by many people uh, so i will divide the marketing into in in my career into two uh, phases phase 1 is what i call the pre digital era yeah. when there was no internet and the second is the post digital era where there is internet and digital platforms so uh, there are about uh, four or five key changes that have happened between the pre digital era and the post digital era uh, the first thing i like to say is that in the way we practice marketing uh, in the pre digital era marketing was very much about the power of creativity and ideas and imagination a lot of work that we did was based on our intuition and on our hunches uh, there was very limited market research that happened if at all and it would be relatively not representative of the entire population it would be a sample and it would be a lag indicator you uh, you did the research then you got the findings and all that today uh, the two new things that have come into marketing so the the power of creativity is still important because ultimately marketing is all about ideas and creativity but what has got added to it post the digital era two more things uh, data and technology 
So if I were to uh, uh, talk about the marketing today, in my language, it is the power of creativity plus the magic of technology plus the beauty of data. Now, what this really means is today, a lot of technology has come into marketing like artificial intelligence, IoT, uh, you know, uh, predictive analytics, all these things, the new age technologies. Uh, and second is we have a lot of data. As a result of this, a lot of data is getting generated, real time, large amounts of data. So today, a marketeer cannot only be a creative person, cannot only be a person with strong intuition and imagination. That is important, still remains important, but must be somebody who is comfortable using technology and is also comfortable working with data. So uh, the new age marketing is about the power of creativity, uh, the beauty of data and the magic of technology. So that is one change. Earlier, there was no tech and data. Yeah. The second change is that uh, as a result of this uh, internet and all, a lot of power has got uh, shifted into the hands of consumers, into the hands of users. We keep talking about things like user-generated content and stuff like that. So uh, the entire paradigm of marketing from the old days where it was a command and control paradigm, I could command the customer as a marketeer. I would be sitting and talking at the customer and telling him that this is what I'll give you. You take it or leave it. Today, it is the other way around. The power has shifted to the hands of the customer. So we have moved from a command and control marketing to a collaborate and co-create marketing. We have to collaborate with our customers. We have to co-create with our customers. We cannot push them around anymore. So that's the second shift. The third shift, and an important shift is that the way we market, as you said, print, television, yeah. the whole uh, mantra was the brand talked and people listened. So the brand said, hello, see me, this is what I do for you. And people would listen to you, whether it was on TV or radio and print. Today, the mantra is the brand does and people talk. So it's, brands can't only talk, they have to do things which are meaningful to consumers and consumers are the ones who talk about it, whether in terms of social media conversations, whether in terms of ratings, etc. So that's the third shift. Uh, the next one really is that, uh, you know, uh, we are an over because of the internet and the way things are, it is an over communicated society. From the time you wake up till you get to bed, the sheer number of messages you have message, to deal yeah. with is mm -hmm. huge. Yeah. And there is a surplus of products and services in any category. Yeah. If you take a, any category compared to 20 years back where there may have been two, three brands today, there are 20. Now, in such a scenario, uh, the whole approach has to move from intrusion to invitation. In other words, traditional marketing through print and television was intrusive. It intruded into your life. You were do, you didn't buy a TV to uh, see ads or you didn't pick up a newspaper. to. So these ads or these marketing messages would intrude into your life. Today, you cannot intrude. People yeah. will shut you out. Yes. So you have to in, be invitational rather than being intrusive. You have to, the brand must invite consumers into its world. It must make itself so inviting that consumers want to go to, uh, to the space or the world of the brand, it cannot try to force itself into the world of consumers. So the whole point is about mind space to life space. So earlier, it was all about capturing mind space, shouting, shouting, getting. Mm -hmm. Today, mind space is a hygiene factor. Uh, just getting mind space is not good enough. What you have to do is you have to get life space, which means brand must uh, tell consumers what role is it playing in their lives? How is it adding value to their lives? What problems in their lives is this brand solving? How will this brand uh, change the way they live, work, do whatever? And the last change is the breaking of entry barriers. In the pre-internet era, large companies were able to create entry barriers for small new players. These entry barriers was typically distribution. Because physical distribution is a very difficult thing to achieve in a large country like India. So large companies had distribution. Small companies uh, wouldn't be able to compete with them on that. Two, large companies has la had large marketing budgets. 
so they could spend huge monies on television right now what has happened is with the internet there is a democratization of sorts so if you look at uh, for example distribution i don't have to set up a physical distribution at all even if i'm a small player i can go through amazon or any e-commerce channel i don't have to spend tons of money on ipl television ads or whatever i can just put a good video on youtube and if it is good it will get viral people will see it free of cost mm-hmm. i can put content about my brand on social media and videos and content free of cost if it is good it will click it will viral so i don't have to spend anything so these artificial in- entry barriers which were there in the pre digital era have also broken down so even a small company can now do business and challenge a big guy yes they, they don't have they don't have to uh, worry about those things so these in my view are some of the fundamental shifts that have happened uh, pre digital and post digital a very well said uh, mr anand and uh, now from you know from this thought only there is a one more you know that uh, ask that most of the time that we get especially on the b2b side of the market here uh, now in b2c that you can drive emotional connect maybe with some very nice tv mm. commercials and all and uh, and earlier in b2b especially so they used to do events and exhibition where they can meet the customer they can to they you know they can get or they used to get the opportunity to have a to create some kind of a connect with the yeah. customer yeah. but now in this virtual world uh you know th- that is you know that that emotional connect mm-hmm. is getting challenged uh where everything mm-hmm. is very it become very mechanical in nature nature yeah w- what's your view what do you suggest okay to- so a couple of things firstly that today marketing has to be digital it has to digital means both physical and digital it's not either or it is both yeah of course the weightage will depend on the nature of your business and who you are targeting however the uh, the the lack of physical connect is a temporary thing it has happened primarily due to the pandemic and as things open out and hopefully we are able to stabilize uh, the physical world will reopen so it's not a f- uh, Uh, not a not a uh, permanent permanent hmm. yeah now coming to uh, the issue of connecting a b2b brand with consumers emotionally versus rationally see there are two things and this is a study that linkedin corroborated uh, when you do brand market uh, marketing today there are essentially and not today it has been there earlier but in the new context there is what we call brand building and performance marketing performance marketing yeah so brand building is what you do at the top of the marketing funnel it's all about creating an image awareness uh, emotion and a connection for your brand and performance marketing is what you do at the bottom of the funnel which is generating leads and nurturing those leads and converting those leads now uh, one of the myths that existed uh was that b2b companies or b2b businesses need not invest in brand building and yeah. they can only uh, get away with investing in performance marketing yeah this was a myth a lot of studies have shown otherwise in fact uh, interestingly there has been a study done by linkedin on b2b marketers and the impact of b2b marketing this is a global study done by linkedin and what did they discovered was quite opposite to what the general belief was yeah. what this study revealed is that if you don't as a b2b business if you don't do brand building your performance marketing roi goes down no. mm. as compared to uh, b2b companies which are investing both in brand building and performance marketing the brand building is actually positively impacting the roi of performance marketing so uh, uh, you need to do both the brand building is more about connecting through emotions and all and even on uh, you know uh, virtual platforms you can create that engagement and connect the word is engagement if you whether you do something physically or virtually you have to engage your if you don't engage it doesn't matter whether you do physically or virtually so yeah. engagement is the name of the game and uh, uh, performance marketing and brand building must go hand in hand 
the old saying that the job of branding is to make selling easier hmm. still yes. holds true yeah yeah so, uh, yeah, yeah exactly uh, the reason why you do brand building is to make the job of your sales guys easier. Mm. So that holds true even today and it holds true both in the virtual world and in the physical world. So my point really is that today uh, you need a combination of high touch and high tech. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of companies are overlooking the touch part mm. and becoming tech, 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 tech. Yes. But ultimately, mm. who is your customer? Even if it's a B2B customer, it's a human being. Yeah. Not a robot. You're, you're not selling to a robot. You're selling to a human being or a bunch of human beings. And these human beings are emotional, uh, have strong emotions as people. Yes. And therefore, uh, uh, you have to balance high tech and high touch. Uh, and uh, today, unfortunately, with all this tech tech happening and all these tools, people are forgetting the touch, touch part. Mm -hmm. Any good business, whether it's B2B, B2C, any category must have a good combination of touch and tech. Yeah. If you lose the touch, you will become very mechanical, as you said. Yes. So that's my take on this. And this is the exact, you know, the message that we want to you know convey to this marketing community that, you know, uh, so that's happening in the market. Whenever there's a one trend, we're right now everyone's talking about the AI, ML, performance mm -hmm. marketing. Mm -hmm. and we tend to forget that, you know, what's the basic fundamental of the marketing is all about. Absolutely. Um, so as you rightly said that, you know, the role of the branding is to help sales guides so that they can go and sell the product. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and I, you know, actually what you said is getting carried away by technology is yeah. basically like you start worshipping the ritual and you forget the God. You don't know God. Yeah. The God is marketing. Yes. Tools are uh, tech. And we forget the God and we start uh, worshipping the ritual. And that is a danger we have to avoid. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so now, uh, Mr. Anand, that, um, so now we're seeing that, okay, uh, second wave is over and uh, hopefully third wave is not going to be as serious as second wave. Um, we can see that, you know, that uh, retailer, you know, the retails and uh, shopping malls, they're opening up. But, you know, that when you go and talk to them, they're still struggling because, uh, you know, the customer like us, we become so used to buying things online and they're very skeptical that uh, whether near future, you know, uh, this will be the habit that will gonna continue or again, we can see the footfall in our stores. Okay, it's an interesting question. So obviously the pandemic skewed buying towards the online space, yeah. correct? Because you didn't, you were not able to go out and buy. Yes. All right. Uh, having said that, if you look at a country like India and you look at data, okay, uh, only about three to four percent of retail sales currently comes through e-commerce. Mm -hmm. Still, 98, uh, 97, 98 percent of sales comes through physical brick and mortar channels. The second is uh, we often tend to forget that during the pandemic, while the online guys picked up for obvious reasons, the Kirana shops were also a big savior. Mm, mm, yeah. We forget that. So yeah. when we talk about brick and mortar, uh, we only think of malls and big format stores and all that. But we forget that in India, the organized or modern retail again is only about 25% of the total physical retail, mm. which means 75, 80% are still small format neighborhood Kirana stores. So if you actually look at data during the pandemic, the e-commerce uh, boom, but so did the Kirana stores, yeah. the friendly neighborhood Kirana yeah. stores. Yes. So it would not be right to say that during the pandemic, the physical retail was killed. It was certain types of physical retails suffered like malls and yeah. big format stores. That's point number one. Point number two is that whether this trend is going to continue, whether footfalls are going to increase, uh, it, uh, my view is it will because uh, we have just got back to normalcy. Yeah. And uh, slowly, slowly as we open out and things become more normal, we will see return of footfalls into the, into the uh, big format retail. However, going forward, there is a very important point here. The point is that uh, the shopping, 
okay is going to get divided in, in for any individual is going to get divided into two types of shopping this is my view one is utility shopping and the other is experiential shopping utility yeah. shopping means you already have a shopping list you know ye wali chai mangani hai ye wala detergent mangana hai sabzi mangani hai ye. to wo to tumko why would you the hell you want to make an effort to go into a market you know rather be you know compete in the traffic struggle to find parking space spend time in the store for a utility purchase because you just get it on your doorstep online however there is another kind of purchase which will always be there which is experiential purchase which is that these are categories you want to see touch feel mm. before you buy okay uh and those kind of categories will continue to thrive in the brick and mortar retail mm. so i think the 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 lesson for the brick and mortar retailers is going to be that they have to move towards experiential categories and experiential selling and uh, their their share in the utility kind of products is going to come down that's going to shift into the e-commerce space going forward which is already happening uh but what is going to continue is the c touch feel experiential categories if you look at even the brick and mortar food and grocery retailers food and grocery is essentially a utility yes. you know once you have decided the brand you just keep reordering it uh they are also offering online so today even a metro cash and carry or a big bazaar or a star bazaar within a 10 km 5 km radius of their store is offering home delivery yes and uh, even the kirana guys have been offering home delivery to their regular customers exactly since many ages including credit you just pay at the end of the month so the point is that brick and mortar retail will have to shift to more experiential driven categories and the online space will get dominated by utility categories so that is the way it's going to pan out in my view i talk a lot about uh, you know consumer co creation hmm uh, so uh, we definitely would like to know more about it that you know what okay. you mean by consumer co so you know consumer co creation is a very interesting thing uh, basically again as i said we uh, today what is happening is people are becoming more individualistic yeah. as human beings and uh, they want a say in things that they are doing in life mm. whatever they do in life they want to have a say including uh, the brands that they buy so uh, companies are realizing as i had told you earlier that it is not going to be about commanding and controlling consumers anymore it is going to be collaborating with them and one of the very uh, effective ways of collaborating with consumers and engaging them is this whole idea of co creation co creation as the word suggests is all about involving the customer in creating your brand or creating interventions of your brand so typically co creation actually happens in two broad areas one is co creation of products which is you involve consumers in creating your products and services uh, and create them in an innovative way and the second is co creation of content what we typically call user generated content you ask consumers to uh, you know uh create content for you you don't create content uh so uh, there are a lot of interesting new age brands that have done this very successfully so i'll just give you two examples if i oh. may so that this becomes clearer yeah. so one interesting example is uh, of co creation of content is gopro cameras now gopro is an adventure camera yeah uh what gopro did is they didn't create a single ad or a communication on their own they just created a youtube channel they collaborated with youtube and asked their customers to post videos so the reason why you put a gopro on your head is if you are doing sky diving or scuba diving or any of those you want to record it from your point of view so what started happening is a lot of videos started getting posted by people in fact uh, gopro's whole philosophy is don't tell it show it and share it so uh and and 
the entire marketing uh, communication of GoPro is user generated. They don't create a single communication from their side. It's all the users putting. What that actually did was help them expand their market. So GoPro is a niche, was a niche product. It was basically for adventure enthusiasts. But when people started seeing so many interesting videos, even if they were not adventure enthusiasts, they said, this is a good idea to buy this camera. You know, may, I may not skydive, but I can record, you know, when I play cricket with my son or, you know, I can shoot a birthday party or I can shoot a small holiday that we have gone to with this perspective. It actually opened up the market. So that's a great example of co-creation of content. Co-creation of a product, a very interesting brand called Glossier. Glossier is a beauty and cosmetics brand in the US, launched in 2008 not too far back, by a young entrepreneur, M Emily Wise, only in her early 20s. This uh, brand actually began as a blog. So what Emily Wise did is she started a beauty blog. She was a blogger and she started a beauty blog where she started asking women, young women to talk about their concept of beauty, their views on beauty products, etc., etc. Her blog became very popular. What she realized in the uh, blog is basically net net what consumers told her in the blog is that the traditional established beauty brands are letting me down. They don't understand me. They don't understand my needs. They are not uh, creating products that are actually uh, for me. They just create products and expect me to buy it. So that gave her an idea that, look, uh, there is a gap. There is a there is a pain point and uh, uh, beauty young beauty millennials uh, young women they are not uh, relating to these big lorias and all these of the world because they feel these guys don't understand them they don't talk to them they don't listen to them they just create products and say you want this buy it so yeah. she then decided that why don't I create a line of products which meet the requirements and address these issues of these young millennial women. And I will co-create these products with them. I will ask them that what kind of a lipstick should we make for you? What kind of a mascara would you like? And she started co-creating products. And today, uh, Glossier is one of the fastest growing beauty brands in the world. It's giving a run for its money to the big, large established beauty brands. So uh, basically, their whole philosophy is beauty products inspired by real life. And uh, this whole conversation, the blog, the co-creation is what the brand is built on. And in fact, uh, they call, they don't call themselves as a brand. They don't say, they say we are not a, a range of beauty products. We are a people powered beauty ecosystem. That is how they describe their business. And uh, so these are just two examples of co-creation. A lot of other companies have also started doing it. Uh, because the point is you are, so one point I want to make is co-creation is more than just listening to your customers. So every good marketing company listens to the yes, customer. Yeah. Uh, often a lot of people, uh, you know, confuse co-creation as listening to, that's not co-creation. Co-creation is, yes, listening to your customers, but creating content done by them uh, or, or using content that they have made. Yeah. And you have collaborated in putting that content or, uh, you know, developing products that they have suggested or they have come up with the idea and you are creating it with them. So it is more than just listening to customers. So that is uh, what co-creation is all about. And it's a fantastic uh, tool for modern marketeers because brands that are doing this are becoming highly successful. Consumers are saying, hey, these guys are understanding me. You know, they are... Uh, they are giving me a say in what they are doing. You know that, uh, so we talked about uh, brand marketing from the corporate side of, you know, that uh, yeah. part of the business. So now mm -hmm. come back, you know, to the space that we're currently you are into, which is the uh, education and economics. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and we strongly feel that uh, uh, when the new marketeer, those are right now getting trained in those academics. Uh, and uh, we also keep in mind that how we can make sure, uh, you know, that uh, the, uh, the the content or or the education system that we are uh, that you are into, it has some real world touch uh, as well. Uh, 
so what's your you know perspective okay first and foremost i think the, there is a problem in education uh, especially management education uh, at an overall level the problem really is that the industry is moving faster than the education yeah so the education has been lagging hmm. uh, the in in changes in the industry are moving faster than the changes in the education the education guys are still caught behind by and large right. so that is the genesis of the problem the, the education system i'm talking more in context of the management education business education is not keeping pace with the industry mm-hmm. although the irony is that their customer is the industry i mean and any mba yeah. Yeah. school or college is creating graduates to put them in industry either take jobs or become entrepreneurs either way you are in business yes. whether you take up a job or become but the irony is that they are the customers but the industry is not keeping pace with the customer it's a classic case of being caught in a time warp and uh, being caught in a status quo uh, the customer is changing faster than you are now mm-hmm. having said that what is the way out i mean that is more important of course i'm not saying that every business school is like that mm-hmm. but i'm talking in a by and large mm-hmm. sense so according to me there are two three important uh, things we must keep in mind the first and more, foremost thing is a shift in the mindset you know when we look at a degree or an education so i will not even use the word degree when somebody is doing a program let's say somebody is enrolling into a mba program okay or an, the typical approach is acha finance karna hai ya marketing karna hai acha mm-hmm. i think the focus has to shift from what to learn to what problems do you want to solve yeah so i come to a business school and uh, often you know as a student after engineering or graduate ask what do you want to learn yaar kya course karna chahta hai to wo kahega mujhe mba karna hai ya mujhe i think that question has to be completely rephrased in today's context mm-hmm. and not just for mba in any kind of education is that it is not about what you want to learn it is about what problem are you excited to solve so if supposing and the problem could be a business problem it could be a social problem it could be an environmental problem it could be a governance problem whatever the problem be but if we tell our graduates or our young people that don't worry about what do you want to learn first think about what problem do you want to solve as an individual each one will have their own uh, interests and once you are clear on what problem you solve then you structure what you want to learn around it so i think the whole uh, focus has to be shifted from uh, learning and you know assimilating knowledge for the sake of a degree hmm. to actually deciding what problem you you want to solve and assimilating knowledge related to solving that problem that is the first yeah. important shift that needs to be made the second important thing is i think faculty in business and that's why i was stressing on the importance of having industry uh, experienced faculty especially in business schools has to stay updated and concurrent with what is happening in the industry if faculty is not abreast with what is happening in the industry how are they going to tell the students what is relevant exactly or what is outdated that a of course faculty should have some basic industry experience but the point is once you moved into academics you must not cut off your mm. umbilical yeah. cord with it mm. i find a lot of people like that they have worked they move and then they suddenly cut off from the industry mm. <laughs> in my case i'll tell you my personal experience i still keep very close touch with the industry mm-hmm. even though now i'm into academics through various ways by participating in talks writing addressing doing right. courses for executives uh, you know even uh, attending a lot of uh, uh, you know seminars or webinars which are relevant to my area and also i have a network of friends i keep in touch with them to find out hey what's happening tell me and i keep consulting with yeah. startups uh, one of the good ways is to keep consulting with com- even if you have become an academician keep consulting with companies yeah. uh, especially startups the reason startups are a good place to consult is because they are into new age stuff yeah yeah, yeah. so you will know the new 
uh, age uh, stuff. So that is very important. And uh, the last thing is, so I talked about three things. One is uh, focusing on learning by solving, learning by doing, focusing on what problem do you want to solve and then create, uh, gather knowledge around it. Second is uh, teachers and faculty needing to be abreast and up to date with what's happening. And the last thing is, Today, you know, things are changing very fast. What mm -hmm. is relevant today will become irrelevant for the, uh, four months later. Yeah. It's a very dynamic situation. So we must impart in students the art of self-learning. Learning. You know, because uh, if you do a two-year MBA, you can't teach everything. And if you teach after four years, a lot of it yes. is becoming irrelevant. So unless you uh, teach students mm -hmm. the art of self-learning, and there are ways of doing it in the way you design your course and all. You should, as a teacher, not give them everything. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, you know, give them the appetizer. Yeah. Uh, Wet their appetite and let them then start discovering. So, for example, one of the things we do in our school is in any course, whether it's a digital marketing course, we will teach them certain things. But we do two things. One is we, keep, we bring in a lot of industry experts to... Uh, supplement what we are teaching them two is we make them roll up their sleeves and do stuff so digital marketing you can keep giving gyan about seo sem you know bbc <laughs> social media but if you don't make the students do create a website pers uh, actually do the seo sem do the uh, you know video do yeah. social media marketing Look at Google Analytics. Yeah. They will not learn. Yes. So Go beyond uh, theoretical learning by solving, which means we need to keep giving them exercises and making them do it, so that when they go to the uh, a digital marketing job from day one, they know how to do it. They don't say, "Ha, mere ko to degree, but mujhe nahi pata kaise <laughs> website." <laughs> you know, yeah. this is the real truth. Yeah. And the. The third, second thing we do is we ask them to do a lot of certifications on their own. Mm. So we say, Chalo, ye humne bata diya aapko. these are the exercises and the projects and assignments you need to do, which is all about doing, yeah. applying and interaction with a lot of industry guys to guest lectures and all so that they're abreast. And more important, start studying on your own. These are four certifications you have to do if you want to clear this course. In addition to our own assessments, these are four certifications, HubSpot, Google, this, that. Yeah, karna hai. Mm -hmm. that, is a, that is a must do to clear the course. The moment they start doing those, they get the habit of self-learn. Yeah. So I think uh, to cut a long story short, uh, three important things. Move from what you want to learn to what problem you want to solve. Two is keep yourself abreast and contemporary and updated and uh, uh, make students apply uh, what you have taught them in a yeah, real world yeah, situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And third is to teach them how to become self-learners. So that once they graduate, they, and even there is no professor, they know how to learn. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, the very, you know, that, um, you know, interesting, you know, uh, thoughts and uh, the special actually we're end of our discussion. And uh, we really enjoyed and I'm sure that our audience uh, today, you know, uh, they get to learn and they get to at least you know, start thinking, in a, you know, to take a different angle, especially, you know, that uh, person that I like the customer co-creation. Uh, everyone's talking about that, you know, that think customer is the first approach, but we, are we really implementing it in the real world? Uh, that's a big question mark. Uh, so again, uh, Mr. Anand, thank you for your time. I know taking your time to share, you share your, you know, very interesting views uh, with our audience. And, uh, you know, hopefully that, you know, uh, uh, you know that you uh, found this discussion interesting and uh, if you have any queries from the audience definitely again we'll uh, touch back with you uh, so that you know you can share your you know more thoughts around it thank you very thank much you. Thank, thank you, you so much it was a very very interesting discussion thank you for inviting me uh, because thank as you. a teacher it's my job to share thoughts with the world at large yeah. and uh, thank you so much and uh, all the best and if there's any further queries and all i'll be happy to answer